Chapter 3 On Marriage Then Almitra spoke again and said, And what of marriage, master? And he answered, saying, You were born together, and together you shall be forevermore. You shall be together when the white wings of death scatter your days. Ay, you shall be together even in the silent memory of God. But let there be spaces in your togetherness, and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Fill each other's cup, but drink not from one cup. Give one another of your bread, but eat not from the same loaf. Sing and dance together, and be joyous, but let each one of you be alone, even as the strings of a lute are alone, though they quiver with the same music. Give your hearts, but not into each other's keeping, for only the hand of life can contain your hearts, and stand together, yet not too near together, for the pillars of the temple stand apart and the oak-tree and the cypress grow not in each other's shadow. CHAPTER Four, ON CHILDREN And a woman who held a babe against her bosom said, Speak to us of children. And he said, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you, and though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children, as living arrows, are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. Chapter 5 On Giving then said a rich man, Speak to us of giving. And he answered, You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. For what are your possessions but things you keep and guard for fear you may need them tomorrow? And tomorrow, what shall tomorrow bring to the overprudent dog burying bones in the trackless sand as he follows the pilgrims to the holy city? And what is fear of need but need itself? Is it not dread of thirst when your well is full, the thirst that is unquenchable? There are those who give little of the much which they have, and they give it for recognition, and their hidden desire makes their gifts unwholesome. And there are those who have little and give it all. These are the believers in life and the bounty of life, and their coffer is never empty. There are those who give with joy, and that joy is their reward. And there are those who give with pain, and that pain is their baptism. And there are those who give and know not pain in giving, nor do they seek joy, nor give with mindfulness of virtue. They give as in yonder valley the myrtle breathes its fragrance into space. Through the hands of such as these God speaks, and from behind their eyes he smiles upon the earth. It is well to give when asked, but it is better to give unasked through understanding. And to the open-handed the search for one who shall receive is joy greater than giving. And is there aught you would withhold? All you have shall some day be given. Therefore, give now, that the season of giving may be yours and not your inheritors. You often say, I would give, but only to the deserving. The trees in your orchard say not so, nor the flocks in your pasture. They give that they may live, 
for to withhold is to perish. Surely he who is worthy to receive his days and his nights is worthy of all else from you. And he who has deserved to drink from the ocean of life deserves to fill his cup from your little stream. And what desert greater shall there be than that which lies in the courage and the confidence, nay, the charity, of receiving? And who are you that men should rend their bosom and unveil their pride, that you may see their worth naked and their pride unabashed? See first that you yourself deserve to be a giver and an instrument of giving. For in truth it is life that gives unto life, while you, who deem yourself a giver, are but a witness. And you receivers, and you are all receivers, assume no weight of gratitude, lest you lay a yoke upon yourself and upon him who gives. Rather rise together with the giver on his gifts as on wings, for to be over-mindful of your debt is to doubt his generosity who has the free-hearted earth for mother and God for father. Chapter 6 On Eating and Drinking Then an old man, a keeper of an inn, said, Speak to us of eating and drinking. And he said, Would that you could live on the fragrance of the earth and, like an air plant, be sustained by the light. But since you must kill to eat, and rob the newly born of its mother's milk to quench your thirst, let it then be an act of worship. And let your board stand an altar on which the pure and the innocent of forest and plain are sacrificed for that which is pure and still more innocent in man. When you kill a beast, say to him in your heart, By the same power that slays you, I too am slain, and I too shall be consumed. For the law that delivered you into my hand shall deliver me into a mightier hand. Your blood and my blood is naught but the sap that feeds the tree of heaven. And when you crush an apple with your teeth, say to it in your heart, your seeds shall live in my body, and the buds of your tomorrow shall blossom in my heart, and your fragrance shall be my breath, and together we shall rejoice through all the seasons. And in the autumn, when you gather the grapes of your vineyards for the winepress, say in your heart, I too am a vineyard, and my fruit shall be gathered for the winepress and like new wine I shall be kept in eternal vessels. And in winter, when you draw the wine, let there be in your heart a song for each cup, and let there be in the song a remembrance for the autumn days, and for the vineyard, and for the winepress. And on work. Then a plowman said, Speak to us of work. And he answered, saying, you work that you may keep pace with the earth and the soul of the earth. For to be idle is to become a stranger unto the seasons, and to step out of life's procession that marches in majesty and proud submission towards the infinite. When you work, you are a flute through whose heart the whispering of the hours turns to music. Which of you would be a reed, dumb and silent, when all else sings together in unison? Always you have been told that work is a curse and labor a misfortune. But I say to you that when you work, you fulfill a part of earth's furthest dream, a sign to you when that dream was born, and in keeping yourself with labor, you are in truth loving life. And to love life through labor is to be intimate with life's inmost secret. But if you in your pain call birth an affliction, and the support of the flesh a curse written upon your brow, then I answer, that naught but the sweat of your brow shall wash away that which is written. You have been told also that life is darkness, and in your weariness you echo what was said by the weary. And I say, that life is indeed darkness, save where there is urge, and all urge is blind, save when there is knowledge." 
and all knowledge is vain, save when there is work, and all work is empty, save when there is love, and when you work with love, you bind yourself to yourself, and to one another, and to God. And what is it to work with love? It is to weave the cloth with threads drawn from your heart, even as if your beloved were to wear that cloth. It is to build a house with affection, even as if your beloved were to dwell in that house. It is to sow seeds with tenderness and reap the harvest with joy, even as if your beloved were to eat the fruit. It is to charge all things you fashion with a breath of your own spirit, and to know that all the blessed dead are standing about you and watching. Often have I heard you say, as if speaking in sleep, he who works in marble and finds the shape of his own soul in the stone is nobler than he who ploughs the soil, and he who seizes the rainbow to lay it on a cloth in the likeness of man is more than he who makes the sandals for our feet. But, I say, not in sleep, but in the overwakefulness of noontide, that the wind speaks not more sweetly to the giant oaks than to the least of all the blades of grass. And he alone is great who turns the voice of the wind into a song made sweeter by his own loving. Work is love made visible, and if you cannot work with love, but only with distaste, it is better that you should leave your work and sit at the gate of the temple and take alms of those who work with joy. For if you bake bread with indifference, you bake a bitter bread that feeds but half man's hunger. And if you grudge the crushing of the grapes, your grudge distills a poison in the wine. And if you sing, though, as angels, and love not the singing, you muffle man's ears to the voices of the day and the voices of the night. End of section 2